This is the lecture on ARM processors for Comp 375 Computer Architecture and Organization at North Carolina A&T State University. Please be sure to fill out the class evaluations for all of your courses. They can be found on Blackboard. The administration really does care about these things. And the faculty like to know how they're doing. The third exam in Comp 375 will be next Wednesday, April 22nd, from 11 o'clock to noon. You have to be logged on to Blackboard during that time period. It will cover all the material we've done since the last exam. Uh, the topics are listed here. It will be an online exam somewhat similar to the format of the second exam. Most of your laptops and desktops and servers use the Intel architecture, your i5s, your i7s, but most cell phones and tablets use ARM processors. The ARM is a RISC machine. Originally, ARM was the Acorn RISC machine. It was later named the Advanced RISC machine. Uh, marketing improvement, I suppose. Uh, ARM Holdings developed the architecture and licensed it to other companies. Uh, the other companies build the chips. ARM just sells the design. Uh, there are competitors to ARM. Uh, Intel makes the Atom. Uh, MIPS makes other machines, and so does AMD. The ARM architecture has been very successful. They've sold over 130 billion ARM processors. Considering the fact there's only 7 billion people in the world, that's a lot of computers. Uh, it's the most widely used instruction set architecture, far exceeding the Intel machines. In 2010, they were producing 6.1 billion ARM processors uh, a year, and that represented 95% of all smartphones, 35% of TVs and set-top boxes, and 10% mobile computers. The answer is C. ARM has designed the computer, but as Intel has designed their machine, but Intel manufactures their machine, and ARM sells their design to other people who manufacture the chip. ARM has licenses that, for the machine that they sell to different uh, manufacturers or chip foundries. They sell different types of licenses. You can get the chip layout, and a manufacturer can use that to make the chip exactly as specified, or some people just take the design and incorporate it into their system in case they want to meet additional specifications. Here's just a short list of some of the companies that license ARM technologies. Uh, the list includes Huawei. Uh, the country doesn't like that one, but ARM is a UK firm. Analog Devices is on the list, and they're headquartered here in Greensboro. The ARM processor was first designed by Sophia Wilson in 1983, uh, and they built the first one four years later. Originally, it was a 32-bit architecture, as were almost all computers at that time. Uh, it has since been upgraded to a 64-bit machine. The ARM processor, uh, when designed, had only about 30,000 transistors, which is about the same number of transistors as an Intel 8086. At that time, the Motorola 68000, which was designed a little bit earlier, had 40,000 transistors. Uh, the ARM people got away with fewer transistors because they didn't use any microcode. This is a RISC machine, which doesn't use microcode, and they didn't have any cache on the chip. Uh, that, of course, has changed, but at that time, few of the machines had cache on the chip. Uh, and so with fewer transistors, uh, 
it managed to use less power than the 68000 or the Intel uh, 286 processor. The ARM is a RISC machine. It uses a load store architecture such that only two instructions, load and store, go out to memory. The rest of the instructions have their operands in the registers. There are 16 registers in the machine, uh, all of which look pretty much the same. And you can do arithmetic in any one of the registers. Uh, the registers are 32 bit wide originally, although they've been widened to 64 bits for the new architecture. Uh, they do not support unaligned memory accesses as the Intel processor does. Uh, our computers require that the operands be aligned. Your Intel uh, doesn't, but your IBM 360, 370, Z-series systems, your ARM, all require that when you're going out to load a four-byte value, that it is on an address that is evenly divisible by four. In the diagram here, uh, the colored sections represent uh, values that are aligned in the first one and unaligned. The first, you see address zero and address eight are evenly divisible by four, but address one and address six are not. On the Intel system, you can pick up those two values without any problem. They are slower, but it still works. Whereas in the ARM processor and other machines, it won't work unless the addresses are evenly divisible by four. The ARM processor originally had 16 registers that were 32 bits. Some of the registers had specific purposes. Uh, register 13 is the stack pointer, which would be like the uh, ESP register on the Intel machine. R14 is the link register. When you call a function, it saves the return address in R14. Incidentally, register 14 is the same register that the IBM 360, 370 series machines used to store the return address. R15 is the program counter. Unlike the Intel system where the program counter is hidden in the ARM system, R15 is just another register the user can access, but it's automatically updated as you fetch additional instructions. When a FIQ interrupt occurs, and there are several different types of interrupts, the CPU has a special set of registers R8 through R12. Therefore, the operating system can use those registers and not have to save them upon interrupt. The operating system has its own version of registers R13 and R14. The answer is A, uh, load R15 with an address. Remember that R15 is the program counter. So if you simply load a new address into the program counter, that changes the next instruction that the computer will execute. Load R15 from R14 is a function return. R14 holds the return address of a function call. There are different types of interrupts on the ARM processor. The fast interrupt requests are a specialized type of interrupt request. The context is not, it's not be saved. That is, you don't have to save the registers and other information uh, because it has its own set of in registers to operate. This saves the overhead of saving the registers and restoring them. And since there's only one source, you don't have to figure out what type of interrupt it was. There are several different CPU modes. Of course, there's the user mode. There's the different interrupt modes. There's a supervisor mode used by the operating system. Uh, abort mode, when an error occurs. Uh, system mode entered by setting the status bits. And then there's the undefined mode, which occurs when an undefined instruction exception occurs. The answer is A, an undefined instruction has an opcode value that hasn't been defined. In other words, there is no instruction for that particular number in the opcode. 
ARM series runs up to ARM 11. There's many different versions. In 2004, they split off the Cortex series, which has been very popular. It has four different uh, models. There's a model for microcontrollers, because the ARM processor occurs in many small machines that need microcontrollers. There's the real-time version for devices that need real-time response. And then there are two versions for general applications, a 32-bit version and the 64-bit version. The ARM2 uh, features a 32-bit bus, a 26-bit address space, and 27 32-bit registers. Now, if you have a 26-bit address space, you should know that 2 to the 6 is 64, and 2 to the 20 is a million, so it's 64 million bytes of addressable memory. There are eight bits of the program counter we use for other purposes. Uh, since we have 32 bit values, there's uh, six bits there, and then the lower two bits aren't used. The top six bits serve as status flags, and the bottom two bits, uh, because they, everything is word aligned, they don't need to be there, since you're always picking up addresses that are word aligned, so you don't really need those last two bits. They must always be zero, so they were used for setting modes. You're trying to save space. That proved to be a mistake. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, originally, it was a th the ARM was a 32-bit machine. They then extended it out to be a 64-bit machine. So only the program can be in the first 64 megabytes to allow 26-bit addressing. And they then allowed other parts of the data to be beyond the 26-bit limit, up to 32 bits. As you will remember from writing Intel assembler programs, when you do arithmetic or do the compare instructions, it sets the condition codes, and then branches are done based on those condition codes. With the ARM processor, any instruction can be based on the condition codes. Consider this simple C or Java program. We've got an if-then-else statement, and inside, a while loop. Here's how you might implement that in Intel Assembler. We have a comparison, to, and then we do a jump to see if it's uh, if it's less or equal. We do the subtraction, we, or we do it, uh, and we have to jump around the uh, else part, and then we have a loop. Here's how you might do it in ARM Assembler. We do the comparison, and the comparison can set the condition based on what the result was. And then we have two uh, subtract instructions. Both of them are based on the condition codes. The sub GT is a subtract if the condition codes are set for greater than. In that case, it will do the subtraction that way. Or the next one is subtract less than. It will do the subtraction if the if the condition goes to set for less than. And then we have a not equal jump. So we will loop if the result was not equal. You'll note that the Intel code, there were eight instructions and the ARM had only four instructions. So it was half as long. Uh, half of the instructions in the Intel were jumps while the ARM only had one jump. Uh, this helps in pipeline because the conditional uh, jumps all uh, slow up the pipeline, which don't occur with the ARM machine because it only has one jump. The early models of the ARM processor had a three-stage pipeline. Later models, as it got as it went on and on, and it got more and more different models. It now has a 13-stage pipeline. Java. Uh, is compiled by the Java compiler into bytecodes, which are stored in a dot class. Bytecodes are sort of machine language for an imaginary machine that is stack oriented. They aren't really executed by the, by the hardware. They are interpreted by your Java virtual machine, or your Java virtual machine may directly compile the bytecodes into native machine language, like an Intel assembler, and then execute that. Certain models of the ARM processor provide hardware to execute the Java bytecodes directly. Uh, the Giselle models can 
execute bytecodes in addition to the regular ARM instructions. Not all the 203 possible bytecodes are implemented. Uh, ARM says that about 134 to 149 of the bytecodes uh, can be translated and executed directly by the ARM hardware. They've added a branch to Java instruction that will allow you to jump from a traditional ARM instruction set into the Java bytecodes. The ARM processor can directly execute the most commonly used bytecode instructions. There are some bytecodes that are not implemented by the hardware, and those can be executed by the software. An interrupt occurs, and the software gets control, and then can simulate those instructions, just like your Java virtual machine does. ARM claims that about 95% of the executed bytecodes are executed directly by the hardware, and only 5% need to be simulated. The uh, J JASL version of the ARM processor does the translation from bytecodes to ARM uh, instructions directly as it fetches the instruction. As it fetches a bytecode, it then does a translation into a series of ARM native instructions. And those native instructions are then fed to the rest of the processor, the pipeline. This would be handy if you executed Java bytecodes on your phone. Android uses a different Java virtual machine and doesn't use bytecodes. Uh, ARM systems have been designed into larger chips that have all sorts of additional subsystems on them. Here's an example of the Calcom Snapdragon, which you can see has networking and GPU and other features on the chip along with the uh, ARM processors. Of course, phones have all sorts of other parts and all sorts of other subsystems. The third exam in 375 will be Wednesday, April 22nd. You have to log on to Blackboard and be there from 11 a.m. to noon. There are many topics that we'll cover. These are all from the last exam, parallel architectures, interrupts, buses, risk processors, pipelining, uh, disks, IO controllers, and RAID. We will be reviewing this material in later lectures. Be sure to complete all of your course evaluations, they're available on Blackboard.